as a child. My parents moved around a fair amount, so lived in lots of different places in the U.S., New York, Texas, Colorado, Florida. So kind of got a taste of the different cultures across America. And my dad was a pilot and also an entrepreneur. And so I saw firsthand someone trying to hustle to make a living and put things together, provide a good life for their family. We had a pizza restaurant growing up. And so I spent a lot of my childhood days working in a pizza restaurant, just kind of thought about work and hard work thing from a very early age. But since my dad was also a pilot, I thought about adventure and you know, I knew the world it was a very big place and was excited to get out there and explore it. Do you have a clear idea of what you wanted to do when you went to university in Notre Dame? No, I did. And my father said it would be great to be an engineer. And so I should start out in engineering. And I knew down deep that I didn't love the math and science stuff I'd done in school and I wasn't amazing at it. So going and doing that in college was a little bit of a surprise, you know, to go from being like one of the kids with the best GPA to just getting crushed the first year in, in engineering 101. And the thing I knew I wanted to do was I wanted to sing in college. So I joined this all male acapella choir that tours all around the world. And yeah, I, just, I kind of found my way through kind of the non-academic stuff. And I feel like my academic journey, my real like intellectual thirst and curiosity came when I went to grad school five years later. And what was the thought process behind going to grad school and doing the MBA? So after college, what I really wanted to do was do international service. I went to this Jesuit high school that really made you want to do service for others was the motto of the high school. And so my plan was to do international service and I applied to a couple of programs and didn't get in. <laughs> and then I got this entrepreneurial fellowship that keeps you in the state of Indiana, another place I never thought I would be spending a ton of time. And they match you up with like a fast growing startup. I got matched up with this company called Angie's List. So I went from being a kind of like middle of the road student in political science to within two months of starting my job, managing a team of 20 people. That's where I felt like I was in my comfort zone. And I worked there for a few years, started a company on the side while I was there, raised some angel funding for it, and then realized that I had no idea what I was doing. And so I'd never taken a business class. And frankly, the people I worked with at Angie's List had gotten their MBA. And that was the first time I ever even conceived of doing that. So it was one of those, you surround yourself with good folks, you surround yourself in a place of high possible potential, and then good things happen. So they were able to encourage me to go to business school and set my sights on a place like Harvard, which was just not something that anyone in my family or extended family had ever done. And what was the experience like at Harvard? I mean, it's quite intense, isn't it? Everyone is really, really gearing for high level consulting jobs. Yeah, I mean, I applied just because I knew folks that had gone there and they encouraged me to apply. I went to visit and I was expecting to be in like a room full of jerks that were full of themselves and intellectual bullies. And I found it to be totally opposite. So I don't know if it's some feeling of like, okay, you can set aside your like achievement hat for a little while because we've all like made it to this place and let's just like learn. I loved how for how people had experience they could call upon instead of just like, did you read the textbook? People from the military, people who'd done the Peace Corps, people from all over the world. And it was an amazing experience where I, at the same time, was like, man, I am not anywhere close to the smartest person here. And also I can hang with a lot of the folks here. So it was like a humbling and also empowering experience. And I think it also changed my perception of what I could and should do with my life, what was possible, how hard I could work, how big of an impact I could have on the world, which is like definitely a two-sided coin or two-sided knife. I don't know what the right phrase is. <laughs> I heard in an interview you said that thanks to that experience, you realized you wanted to do something entrepreneurial to help people and it also should be global. I wonder how you came to that thought and also how you decided to work on that to create your own startup. You mentioned a bunch of consultants or bankers. I didn't apply to a single job while I was there. I knew that I wanted to use that experience as a way to start my own thing, as a way to kind of like change what my resume had been to date, which was a person who had worked in Indiana for a few years and grew up in America into something more akin to like world traveler, a citizen of the world, that sort of thing. You know, we were talking before we turned on the mics and it's nice to be able to say like Salamat Pagi to someone and, you know, like in a different part of the country of the world and like know a way around Kuala Lumpur and also have been from a place like this. So I wanted to get out and see the world and also experiencing it from a business perspective because while I was there, stretching back to that desire to do something 
kind of service to others. I spent time in Kenya working with a microfinance organization and really discovered the unfairness around access to finance and how money and talent and opportunity just aren't distributed fairly. And so that's where I kind of got the idea to pursue access to finance, access to credit and start my first company. So what was it like running your own startup, which you've described as a dream job for seven years? Yeah. I mean, anyone you talk to who's done it says it's a roller coaster. You feel like you're six months away from total success and six months away from absolute failure. Some of the highest highs and lowest lows that I'd have had in my life. Anywhere from the first month that we incorporated the company, we got a contract with the largest bank in Africa to run a pilot across three countries to like our biggest customer canceling a contract unexpectedly and having to fire 10% of the staff and fire people before they've even started all the highs and lows. But I think importantly, it allowed me to bring some of my friends on board and have like close relationships and experiences with them, develop a bunch of new friendships. I mean, our company was operating in over a dozen countries and we had people from over a dozen countries. And so getting to like really experience the culture and live in places all over the emerging world was incredible. Do you feel as though you were burning out at that point in time? Yeah, it's a good question. I didn't really have the language for burning out at that point. I think we now as a society understand it a bit more. But even five years ago, I assumed that burning out was something you did at some job you hated, right? So like some bankers or consultants burn out like, oh, of course, they're working 100 hour weeks and they don't like what they do. But for someone to burn out from their dream job was not something that I had in my kind of quiver. And so funnily enough, I think it was a mixture of feeling like I wasn't at my best self. Then I was not as happy to be doing what I was doing and my temper was shorter and that kind of thing. My co-founder is kind of having a conversation and being like, hey, are you OK? Like you seem to not be as gung ho to do the things that you were doing before and may have had an intervention with me about my facial hair, which isn't much better now than it was then. You know, luckily, I had really supportive co-founders and management that I worked with and we were able to work something out. My co-founder and I each kind of said like, all right, we need to kind of take a step to the side here. if This is going to continue to be successful and, and go without us. How do you distinguish between just being stressed and actually burning out and needing to take that time out? That's a good question, too. I think that burnout, there's a clinical definition, right? So you can look it up. It's about like efficacy. Like, Can you even muster up the resources to continue on? And I don't want to diminish the clinical definition of burnout by applying it to my scenario. I believe I had a lot of the kind of aspects of burnout. I think that when you're stressed, that feels like something that you can kind of recover from. So you take a vacation, clear the decks, or there's stress and there's you stress, right? So when you like lift weights or do exercise, like certain stress helps your muscles grow and repair and things like that. I feel like when you're to the point where you're not repairing, you're not restoring and rejuvenating, no matter what you do, it's like perpetual inefficacy feels like the boundary. And I think this is what a lot of folks in the world felt this past year is there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Like everything is harder and like, I don't seem to be kind of recovering and, and doing better. So yeah. But again, if you aren't used to it, you don't know that that's a possibility. Your kind of worldview just kind of shrinks. Like your aperture kind of like closes in and you forget that there's all these other possibilities of how you could feel, how your body would feel, how your mind would feel, like how rested you could be, how excited about your work you could be, that you just like start to forget as you get a little bit of tunnel vision. And in terms of the intervention, was there a point where it suddenly clicked for you? How did it make it effective for you to accept that I'm doing something I love, but I'm actually burning out? <laughs> yeah, I remember my co-founder and I talked on uh, a board meeting that we had where we were just talking about what the next year or two would look like. And that's when we both kind of decided that we would you'd be like hiring people so that we could like step a little bit aside and, and take some time off and approach work differently. And I think to me, it was about knowing you had this permission that it was possible to take off, right? I mean, I think a lot of people get stuck in this mode where you assume that the way things are working is the only way it can be. And only by seeing like, no, no, you have permission to take time off. Like you can design a way, like the company will be fine without you. Hey, it's okay. We'll make it work. Allows you to kind of take that weight off, I think. Do you feel guilty leaving behind something in someone else's hands? Totally. And I think the first phase of my sabbatical was really like wrestling with those inner demons of not only did I feel like I was burdening my coworkers, but I also felt like our company had a mission of access to finance and 
Like, why can't I kind of soldier on? And these folks are a lot worse off than I am. And like, who am I to take time off and take a break? So there's a lot of guilt and shame there because we're just kind of programmed to work. We're not programmed to think about living life outside of work and bringing in a salary and that kind of stuff. So it was jarring. Do you feel like you brought that feeling into your sabbatical and wanted to make it as, I suppose, fruitful as possible in this short period of time? I definitely approached the sabbatical, I think, like most type A people do, which is like, okay, on my sabbatical, I'm going to learn a language, learn an instrument, get yoga certified, climb this mountain. Like I had a list of, you know, 20 things. When I look back, I did like two of them. And that was awesome. But you take that same productivity accomplishment mindset into your time off, which is totally ridiculous, but everyone does it and you don't realize how ridiculous it is until you've done it. How was that four months? So the first thing was that the four months was supposed to start four months earlier. So I kept on trying to leave the company and like it's n- no fault of my colleagues, but like something would come up and I'd be like, ah, you know, I'm the best person to do this. And we'd be chasing some deal or some investment or some acquisition. There was never the right time. And I even like subletted my condo so that I would like leave for sure on September 1st. And I didn't set off until like January 15th. And so I was standing on friends' couches. I ended up spending time with my parents. And as like a, I think, 33-year-old at the time, or 32, I was like, this is not how I imagined this happening. (laughs) I spent a lot of time doing that. And in some senses, it was a blessing in disguise, getting those alerts from Google Photos that five years ago, here's what you were doing. And, you know, I got to help nurse my mom back to health. I helped my father renovate a little cabin in the woods that he had bought. And so it provided this actually really nice quality time with my family that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise ever. The last time I'd spent that much time with them was in high school, right? And then the thing that really got me to like leave, leave was I officiated a friend's wedding and they were having kind of a honeymoon in New Zealand where his family was. I wasn't crashing their honeymoon necessarily. It was his family was from New Zealand. And so they were kind of taking like a 12 passenger van of like her family and friends to to meet some of his family and just see New Zealand. And so they invited me along and I was like, well, I've kind of wanted to go to New Zealand, but it wasn't a place that was really high on my list, but this will get me out of here and it'll be like fun to be with friends for a bit at the beginning. So I went to New Zealand, spent a week with them and then bought a motorcycle and just kind of motorcycled around the country for a month, did a 10 day Vipassana silent meditation retreat. And then the main thing that I wanted to do on my sabbatical was this Buddhist pilgrimage in Japan on the island of Shikoku. So you walk around and visit these 88 temples that this guy who brought kind of Buddhism from Japan visited. And so you're kind of tracing his path along. Those are basically the two things that I did. So you completed the whole thing and you wore the actual outfit as well, the white suit and the, and the cane. Did you bring everything with you and did a proper pilgrimage? Yeah, well, I actually didn't bring like anything with me. I brought my backpacking gear and I really didn't know what to expect. And of course, I'd spent months picking out the perfect shoes and testing them and breaking them in. And then they fell off my motorcycle when I was in New Zealand. So I had to buy like new shoes. And so you get there and you buy like the whole white vestments and like the sage hat and uh, like a walking stick with a bell on it. So you're constantly reminded to be present and like a stamp booklet where it has the calligraphy from each temple you visit. You buy that all from the first temple. And so I didn't speak any Javanese. I didn't know what I was doing, but you buy a guidebook and you kind of like look at the map and you just start going. Isn't there this concept of the Osatai? Yeah. So you're walking along, you look like a pilgrim. Yeah. You're walking, especially at the beginning through cities. And so everyone knows that you're on this journey. And especially because you're a foreigner, they're like, oh man, this person needs help. And so every day, at least once, usually multiple times, some just random stranger would come up to me and give you like a piece of fruit or buy you a coffee from a vending machine or take you to their house to stay overnight. And so you're constantly being given these kind of small gifts of gratitude, which is crazy because They won't accept anything back. You give them like a little paper slip that says thank you. It has your name on it. So it's kind of a constant reminder of just the thing I liked about it is every day, just in regular life, you see people and, you know, you probably don't think anything about them, but a lot of them are probably going through a tough time. And this is like a way to actually see that someone is intentionally putting themselves through a a difficult time. (laughs) And so you can identify that and make someone stay a little bit better and just means the world to people that are on that journey. And you said as well that you were speeding through the route for three quarters of that journey until you decided to take your time. What was that like? I mean, kind of what I said before, 
or with approaching things with a type A perspective. I read something that was like, oh, you should do 20 to 30 kilometers a day. And I was like, okay, I'll be doing 30. And then I'm kind of walking, I'm passing people along the way. I can't really speak to folks anyway, so I didn't really have any distractions. And you're kind of like making your way through it and you're focused on every day and the daily hardships. And about two thirds, I think, of the way through, we were in this town that was across the bay from Hiroshima. And so I like put all of my stuff in a locker and I took the ferry across to Hiroshima. And it was really the first time I was out of that pilgrim mindset and had a nice meal and was walking around the Peace Park, kind of in the middle of Hiroshima and was just like, what am I doing? Like, why? <laughs> like, I'm almost done. I'd been to the hospital earlier, like in the month because my feet were so beat up and just kind of miserable. And it was the first time I stepped back and said like, why am I doing it like this? What am I rushing for? I'm kind of terrified of what happens next. And so I'm certainly in no rush. So is it a point of reflection of like, why do I approach things this way? What does it say about me? Can I change that? Or do I need to adapt, like just adapt to what I do in the future, knowing that that's how I'm going to approach things. So it's a kind of an interesting moment of reflection. And after that reflection, do you feel that taking your time was a lot better for you? Was there any surprising revelations about yourself? Yeah, it was surprising because I went slower for like two days and then I just kept going the same speed and I, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I mean, I could not walk just like 20 kilometers per day and just like sit around and read a book. I had to kind of like push it. And so at least I kind of learned that about myself and I got to interrogate that and sit with it. And as a kind of self-imposed penance, what I decided to do was like, okay, like I will finish two days or three days earlier than, than people normally would. And I'm just going to like sit at the first temple and just like give out gifts like the Osetai and like kind of a care package. So I, I bought these little things and I had band-aids and little like candies, a map. I can't remember what else I had there. And I just sat there and I like gave like anyone who looked like a pilgrim. I was like, here you go. Like, good luck if you have any questions. And I also thought that I would be like some like heroic person and people would want to talk to me and say thanks. But like every single one of them was like an old Japanese man who I couldn't even speak to. And so, and so it was just this very kind of Buddhist thing where you like end at the same place you begin and like none of the things that I wanted did I get, but it was also perfect. And so like, it was totally appropriate, but very frustrating. <laughs> I find it curious that you use the word penance. I mean, is pushing yourself physically that bad? I mean, we will get into the whole sabbatical part. But one thing I took away from researching is that Solanus is not related to what the work you're doing before. You can still work. So arguably, physically pushing yourself was acceptable. Yeah, I mean, I think that my desire for my sabbatical was to like to heal and to learn and explore. And instead, I found myself applying the same kind of like type A accomplishment mindset to like whatever thing I put my mind to. So I felt like I wasn't really inhabiting another mindset or like another person. I was just kind of like realizing that the, the way that I am, I'm going to like apply it to anything and I can't, it's not the job's fault, it's me, which is a really important lesson. And I, I see this in a lot of the interviews and conversations I have with folks is that they assume that once they take the person out of the consulting firm, that everything's going to be fine, but it's really like, it's a longer battle. And that's like the important one to be a part of. What was your plan after your own sabbatical? What are we thinking of doing? I mean, the first thing that I felt like I wanted to do was like step down from my company. I think the observation that I had was that if I wanted to focus on relationships and friendships and family, like I had to stop living out of a suitcase and having this really adventurous lifestyle. Because I was in a situation where any given weekend I could either stay around Boston where I was kind of living or I could go to Moscow and present to the largest credit bureau in Europe and like, why not? go a few days earlier and go to St. Petersburg. You know, I mean, the more I solve the world, the more excited I got by it, as opposed to being kind of like not wanting to, to see it. And so I felt like I wanted to like create a context for which I could have a more sustainable lifestyle and like kind of put that like international, like jet setting version of myself, like to bed for a while. I think especially in business school, they teach you to do things at scale, right? Like how many millions of people can you help? And like, why not billions? And I was really feeling like I wanted to have more of like an intimate relationship to folks that I was helping. So I felt very far removed from the actual good that we were doing. 
And so I'd been on the board of this nonprofit called the Lab for Economic Opportunities at Notre Dame, and they do domestic poverty, like intervention studies. So like, does this approach to solving homelessness work? Does this approach to community college graduation work? Why not? Why? And I've really liked working with these folks and I love their mission. Why don't I just kind of volunteer my time with them for a year and see if I can help them and try to be closer to like folks on the ground doing good in the world. And so that's kind of as far as I had thought through it at that point. So I stepped back, stepped back up to the board of my organization, stepped down from the board of that nonprofit to be the interim director. And just in my brain, I was like, man, that sabbatical had such a big impact on me. Like, I feel like my job here is not done. So just kind of kept talking to folks about it. And how did that collaboration with Professor Matt Bloom start? Serendipitously, just in the same way that my startup out of Harvard started because I was just telling people what I wanted to work on, access to finance. And then someone said, oh, hey, I heard of these professors over here. You should reach out to them. Same thing. So the more people I told about sabbaticals, the more people would connect me to other people. And I got connected to Professor Bloom, who had done work on thriving and flourishing at work. And he actually had a bit of a similar story where he worked in industry and I think Lehman Brothers until he was in his early 30s. Totally burnt out, thought his work was relatively meaningless and wanted to kind of go back to, to school to figure out how people find meaning, how they flourish and thrive in work. And so we had one conversation and he was like, great, I'd love to support your research. Let's collaborate. So then I kind of went from startup founder to like a nonprofit kind of interim managing director to bottom of the barrel, like researcher, like qualitative re researcher, just like calling people and, and doing multi-hour interviews like you're doing and then like coding them and like all that stuff. And so it was a very like humbling, humbling experience. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the sabbatical project and what kind of parameters have you set around it? The sabbatical project is basically the big umbrella that I'm putting everything under. So it started out with research around sabbatical takers. So why do they take them? What happens while they're on sabbatical? Like how do they change when they come back? And then like the overall kind of goal of the movement is just to give people kind of inspiration, permission, and like a blueprint for taking extended leave in their life. So trying to create a rigorous academic research and evidence around the benefits and impacts of taking time off, case studies, interviews, stories from folks that have found a way to do it over the course of their life and over the course of a, a regular career. You know, what my hunch was and what our research confirmed is that really, like, if you have this story in your mind that it's possible and it's normal, taking time off really isn't that big of a deal. But for most folks, they think about life as like, oh, you graduate and then you get a job and you put your head down and then you have a family and you like retire. In some kind of corners of the world and some companies, there's a different story. But for most people, that's kind of what it is. And so really it's about like raising awareness of who actually takes time off. How can you do it? How can we change the way we work for the better? So it's more inclusive for everyone of all kind of like financial means. This is the first of its kind research into professionals, right? It's never been done before. How many people have you interviewed? What are your parameters around those? So the academic research was over 50 people from you know, maybe a dozen different countries. I personally have interviewed hundreds. People come to me like companies or individuals. I wouldn't say we put any parameters around it other than looking for new companies that want to do rigorous randomized control trials around what impacts extended leave have. And I think now it's just like, I'm trying to find stories of as many different types of people in different life stages and different places as possible that everyone kind of has an example they can point to to say like, oh, like that person reminds me of myself or like I could see myself in that position. And it looks like they've kind of ended up okay. I don't think like a privileged white entrepreneur, Ivy League educated dude is going to convince anyone that it's possible for everybody. And it, it certainly is not yet. But the more stories we can collect and the more influence we can have on companies and governments kind of like setting policy to enable people to take time off, like the more accessible it becomes. I suppose we can't jump in further without actually defining what a sabbatical is. So how would you define it? First of all, what I'll say is that I wish that we didn't have to use the word sabbatical. I think the reason why people use it is because a sabbatical sounds kind of like a fancy thing. It's a thing that professors do. It's like permission to take time off as opposed to just saying like, I burnt out or like I need a break or like I'm going through a really, really tough transition. And so the reason why I use the sabbatical project and the word sabbatical is because it's meaningful to folks. Like they understand kind of what it is as opposed to inventing a term. Our definition, since there's no real definition, is 
extended time off routine work. That definition has three components. One is extended. So how long is long enough? From our studies and from the interviews we've done, it seems like at least six to eight weeks is usually what it takes for folks to really feel like they disconnect from work. Like that's just a start, right? The most you can take, great. And like think you can work up to taking a longer period of time off. But most folks say like three to six months feels like ample time. It's great if you can have more. Sometimes it feels like too much. So there is such a thing as it too much because I read in your FAQs that 12 months is like a luxury. So if you go beyond that, is there such a thing as too much? I don't know. I mean, it's funny because some people ask, well, like once I take time off, if I take that much time, I'm never going to want to return to work. And I've like, I've never heard that actually happen. <laughs> I, I interviewed Gagan, which is how I think we got connected. And he took 18 months and you could tell that he was like struggling not to like start a new business sooner, you know, and like having to prevent himself from having those conversations. And I think most folks like the imperfect metaphor I use is it's like sabbaticals are like psychedelics, not like heroin like you don't take mushrooms and then just like want to take more and more and more every day i think you kind of like have an experience and then you're like ready to go back and then like maybe do it again some other time i think you take time off and you're not like oh man i never want to work again you're like wow this is harder than i thought it would be man i'm really enjoying exploring a lot of other stuff and like you know what i'm ready to like with my new understanding of who i am and what i want to do i'm ready to like go get it um, and I really hope I can do this in the future and like maybe I'll like intentionally plan to do it. But I just haven't heard of folks being like totally going off and never coming back. It reminds me of a much earlier interview I did with Caesar Kuriyama, who is a CEO of One Second Every Day. And he said he was inspired to take his leave because he listened to a TED Talk by Stephen Seckmeister, who was talking about you should take many, many retirement breaks throughout your career. Sounds like what yeah. you were suggesting is very similar to what he's suggesting as well. Exactly. Yeah. I think he's the only other TED talk that I've kind of found on the subject and kind of like the most popular talk on it. So for sure. And then like to, to that point, like with Stefan Sagmeister's talk, the second part of the definition is time off. Right. And so it doesn't mean that you're not working to some extent. I had people that wrote books. I had people that wanted to see if they wanted to run an eco lodge. And so they like went and worked in the eco lodge. It's very different from life as a consultant, but like your work has to be like very different from what you normally do. And like, preferably to kind of like answer a question or to like cleanse yourself, like yoga teacher or something like that. And then the third part of the definition is routine work. So similarly, like, what are you doing normally? Like, are you trying to make any money from it? If you're off and you're searching for a job, like I would argue that's your routine job. Like when you're not employed, your job is to find a job. And so it's really about like, what's your normal routine and how can you get out of it as far as possible to give yourself that perspective. You said before that travel by itself doesn't ensure this connection. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, and I think the opposite side is true as well. Like just because you don't travel, it doesn't mean that like you can't be disconnected. So I think it's really about like intentions and boundaries. If you travel to London and you're from New York and like you're working from a shared workspace and you're going to cafes and stuff like like does it really feel that different from what you're doing before i think it's harder more and more to not be connected to what's going on in the news or connected to your friends and folks via social where it's just hard to get disconnected i mean i'd be lying if i said that i wasn't connected when i was walking on the freaking pilgrimage in japan sleeping on benches you know what i mean you have like the internet and it's kind of brutal and it's distracting so it's all about like what boundaries you set 